Here with me today are the winners of the top selling uh, equity and fixed income category. So uh, we have Darren here from Shorter Asian Growth, as well as uh, Danielle from First Centier Bridge, and Wai Mei from East Spring Investments Asian Hayu Bond. So uh, for a quick introduction to all of our winning funds over here, can I get you guys to describe in a few sentences how would you describe your fund and its investment philosophy? Can I get uh, Daryl to start? Thank you so much and, and very good evening everybody and thank you to IFAS and FSM1 and to other investors for your support. Shoulder Asian Growth is a fund that was incepted in 1991. It does have a long track record and I would say the fund is a very focused, high conviction equity fund. We're very focused on bottom up investment opportunities, looking for growth Asian companies at a res reasonable valuation. And really what we're trying to do is to find companies with long-term structural growth trends. Thank you. And Danielle? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, so First Centia Bridge um, is actually an Asia balanced portfolio. I think many of you will actually be familiar with the fund. Uh, what the fund actually invests in, and I think it's something that's relatively unique, is it's actually a feeder fund structure. So I don't think there's many funds out there that still perform on this structure. But then again, it actually fits into two underlying funds, which is one in the equity portion and the other in the fixed income portion. And with this, we actually have two specialist teams that's actually managing this fund. So we have the fixed income managers that's managing solely only on a fixed income basis. And then the equity managers that's actually managing on the equity basis. Then um, target allocation for the fund is actually 50-50. So there's a buffer of up to 60% each asset class. There's also active rebalancing that's actually being done for the portfolio on a daily basis. And I think what we actually do is really based on a mathematical formula where we really buy low, sell high. So in any market situation, what the portfolio will be actually doing is really to buy into the lower asset class and to actually sell the so-called more expensive asset class. Hi, um, we're, I'm from East Spring, and if you know East Spring, it's actually wholly owned by Prudential of the UK, and uh, we're deemed to be the Asian expert. So as you know, we like to tell you basically our view of Asia, and we believe we have one of the well, most well-resourced teams in Asia looking at um, the companies in Asia that we invest in. So like even in the high yield space, as you know, we've gone through a very stressful time uh, with Asian high yield and uh, unprecedented stress in property. But I think if you see the performance of late, you will know that the team has actually continued to stick to our process, to stick to the things that we know. And uh, you know, with that, I think in the long term, you will see that we will uh, you know, do our best to pull ahead. And I, I think um, that's the kind of thing that you can see in our track record. Uh, the other thing that's good about us is that being Prudential owned, we are very true to label. Uh, we are very true to focus to what we are investing in. So what you see is what you get. If you are invested in Asian high yield, you're going to get Asian high yield returns. If you are invested in uh, US, you're, you're getting US returns. So that's very focused for us. Thanks. There's been a tough year for both equities and bonds again the back, against the backdrop of high inflation and also rising rates. And in Asia, where all of your funds are invested in, uh, China is facing a lot of challenges such as the mortgage crisis, we have COVID-19 flare-ups, as well as most recently the power crunch. So my question for Darren, for shorter Asian growth, against this current backdrop, how is your fund positioning for the next 12 months? And are there any markets or sectors that you like within Asia? Thanks for that question. I think we ran earlier did a lot of my job for me. We are, for shorter Asian growth, um, we, we do like China, clearly. Almost 40% of the fund is invested in China. Uh, then we have about 20% in Hong Kong. But Asian growth is also a diversified strategy. We are well diversified even into Taiwan, into India, into Korea even. Some of the sectors we do like, uh, as I mentioned, we are looking for companies that can do well in years to come, will be in the technology space such as semiconductors, at this point in time, we do like financials, as interest rates are helping the banks. We also do like consumer discretionary stocks. There's a big focus on climate change. 
uh, particularly in China, moving towards net zero. We are also looking at opportunities within the renewables or even some of the lithium-ion battery companies. And my question for Danielle, for First Centre Bridge, are there any markets or sectors that are currently overweight or even underweight on across both of your equity and your fixed income sub funds? Yeah, as the fund actually invests into two different asset class, I'll split my answer into two. Um, so for the fixed income portion, uh, we have actually been maintaining a cautious approach. We have actually been de-risking a little bit in terms of our credit positions. Um, but then at the same time, I think with the recent volatility in the market, we have actually been quite tactical in terms of what we actually uh, buy into in terms of selective names within some of the tech space in China, as well as even looking at some of the Chinese property names. Uh, our exposure are not huge at this point in time in terms of Chinese property, but I think um, the, the view from the team is that prices are really at all-time low. Um, so it, it, it could be a, a chance for us to start looking at quite a number of the Chinese names that have actually been beaten down. Um, overall, we think that the Asia IG um, sector are looking at uh, a relatively attractive value right now. Um, All-in yields are relatively high. I think if you compare over the last five to six years, the yields now are really looking quite attractive. In terms of equities, um, similar to what Darren have actually mentioned, we are relatively positive on China, uh, but all this is really a result of our bottom-up approach. So we are strictly bottom-up, but when we actually look at the outcome of our bottom-up stock picking, you'll see that we have actually been trimming quite a bit in India. So our India exposure within the portfolio have actually done quite well, um, but valuations are getting quite stretched. So we have actually trimmed off some of our India positions. And on the other side, we have actually added on to some of the names that we like. And quite a lot of them are actually in China, where valuations have actually been getting uh, cheaper. So some in the healthcare space, in the technology space, um, as well as consumer staples. And for Waimei, against the backdrop of rates staying higher for longer, and also we are seeing quite a number of a high amount of stress in the Chinese property sector, how are you managing your duration risk as well as the credit risk for your fund? Sure. Uh, with high yield, really duration is a, a, a very uh, it's a very short duration kind of uh, animal. Um, with Asia credit as well, it has the shortest duration compared to the DM markets, so, but. Um, as a whole, broadly, what we're doing is uh, trying to hedge the portfolios with basically a barbell strategy. We're using, we're basically buying long-end uh, investment-grade bonds with bigger spread buffers, and we're actually shorting the front end uh, with futures. So that's a, a bit of a hedge against a, a recession scenario. Um, in terms of credit risk. Um, as you know, you know, uh, I think we, we all agree that you know, China is cheap and we are starting to see the support that's coming in into the property space. But I think looking at the broad uh, zero COVID policy, one of the adjustments that we have made to our portfolios is to uh, you know, consider the impact of that on the Macau gaming sector. Because to us, even though Macau can open, a zero COVID policy will still restrict the number of visitors that come to Macau. So you'll see that one of the adjustments that we made to our portfolios is to basically um, reduce the number of uh, weaker companies in the uh, Macau space because we think that some of them uh, may actually feel a little bit more stressed in a the, in the year or so uh, if this continues. And now let's talk a bit about your investment process across all of your, all of your funds. Uh, for Darren, what kind of matrix or factors do you look at when you are deciding whether or not to buy or sell a stock? We, we are also a bottom-up manager, I think, very similar with First Cent here. I think one of the strengths for behind the shoulder Asian growth team is the breadth of the investment team as well as experience. Uh, fund manager is Mr. Toby Hudson, who's been with Shoulders for three decades. He's been managing the fund nearly two decades. It's really a tried and tested approach. We really spend a lot of time looking into companies, into their balance sheets, but it's also about interviewing company management, finding out their plans, and, and we believe that's a, how we can also add value to investors. Uh, but really what's behind Shoulder Asian Growth is the approach where we identify companies which can deliver strong returns on their capital. So it's really about how efficiently and well managed a company is, high quality, and to make sure they are not over leveraged. I also say a key part of our process is profit taking. We want to make sure 
we lock in against when the market opportunities are right. Thank you. And for Danielle, uh, within the underlying funds and first center breach, do you have any stock or any bond that you have a very high conviction in? Yeah, so we do have a company in our equity portfolio that we have actually been ending on in recent times. And in line with what everyone has been talking about, which is actually in China. So we have this company called Media Group in China um, that we actually is in one of our top 10 holding. So Media, I think some of you will know this company, is actually China's largest home appliances company. Um, it deals with you know, a portfolio of refrigerators, air conditioners, washing machines, and a lot of other smaller home appliances. And this company is established in China. 10 years ago, no one will actually heard about this company outside of China. So in Singapore, you wouldn't have heard of media. But if you look in recent times, um, especially over the last couple of years, you have seen a lot of more of Chinese products coming, or Chinese brand products coming into Singapore. And media is actually one of it. Um, it's established in China, but it's available in more than 150 countries. So it's really more a global company now, rather than just a Chinese company, which we have seen in a lot of the Chinese uh, companies that we actually own in, within the portfolio. And in China, you do see this trend, a uh, couple of trends, in fact. One of it is actually premiumization, where we see that a lot of people have increased in terms of their salary. Um, so you have more money to spend, so they actually tend to spend on more premium items. So I think uh, Media Group does benefit from it. At the same time, there's also another trend called consumption upgrading, where they, people actually upgrade in terms of the things that they actually use. So, you know, historically, you will see that instead of using washing machine, people in China could be using hand washing. So, you can see that they are upgrading. So, there's a lot of potential um, for consumers in China, in China, or at least a lot of poten potential for the company um, in China to actually grow. And for Waimei, can you give us an example of a credit selection within your fund that went well? And also another example of a credit selection that did not go that well. And in those instances, did you take profit or, and cut loss? Yeah, I think looking at how uh, the market went, I think there were more uh, regrets than uh, um, things that we were happy about. But just to stick to you know, what happened last year, I think we have to um, highlight that we actually took a big position in Huarou when the news first broke that they were not able to publish their accounts. And we really um, did dig deep into you know, our views about Huarou and the support of the, com uh, the government to uh, the AMC, to the asset manager. And we actually stuck to the, the thesis that they were too big to fail. And uh, because of that, we actually bought into a, a, a relatively bigger position, about 3, three to 4% in some of our funds. And it actually turned out well uh, at the end of the year uh, when you know, they, they finally got recapitalized. Um, so this is one of the things that I think um, you know, is credit to the team because we do go into uh, deep, you know, we go into the credit analysis of a particular company quite deeply and we try to understand where the rating agencies are coming from. Uh, in terms of the uh, bad selections and uh, there's quite a few but I will zoom into one which I, I particularly regret because um, there was a particular company that we were uh, concerned about which was Shimao and I think if you know it's a property company relatively large quite large in Shanghai and we've heard about the noises on shore about uh, some of their private debt uh, and what they were struggling to pay their private debt and that was at the end of December so what we did was we, we really did uh, meaningfully trim our positions to nothing. Um, unfortunately, what happened after that, or fortunately, was that the Shanghai Sasek actually came in to help the company uh, to tie over some of their dues. And we took that as a signal of support. And so we bought back into that position. Uh, and the fund is still holding it, uh, despite the fact that it's defaulted um, uh, a few months ago. Um, the reason why we are continuing to hold it is because it's trading at a very, very low uh, recovery value of about you know, 10 cents, which just doesn't make sense to us. Uh, and I think it's a confluence of, you know, it's a risk-off situation in the last two months. And so no one is actually trading the bond as if there was any recovery value uh, baked into the price. So we are waiting for some better recovery as a, a, a restructuring proposal is actually uh, on, on the table right now. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we'll see some better outcomes in a year to come. 
Thank you so much for sharing some of the lessons that uh, you have learned from Fan. And finally, can I get all of our panelists, panelists here to summarize a few reasons why our investors should consider including your funds into their portfolios? Can we start with Darren? Thank you. I'll, I'll leave you with three points. The, the first point is shoulder Asian growth is a best-in-class equity portfolio. So if uh, you have a medium or long-term time horizon, these are all companies you want to own. Second reason, valuations are looking attractive. Uh, markets are very challenging this year. But it also means at the current levels, we do see more upside rather than downside. And my third point, there's a lot of noise. Um, China, Taiwan, so many events this year. But I will also say, when you look a little bit longer term, and these are all still key reasons to be investing in Asia, in China, you have a very strong demographics, emerging class wealth, consumerism, millennials, very young population. You also have a lot of technology, a lot of innovation. So these are all key points to continue investing in Asia. Thank you. Thank you. And for Daniel? Yep. So Darren shared three. So since you already covered Asia, I'll share two. Um, so anyway, just now I did mention that um, First Century Bridge is actually an Asia balanced portfolio with a target allocation of 50-50 into um, Asian equities as well as Asian fixed income. So there's this active rebalancing that's actually being done on a daily basis. And we feel that this disciplined approach of rebalancing actually help to manage volatility throughout different market cycles. Um, it helps to balance off your risk return profile as well. I think many a times, I think investors, even ourselves, where we look at markets and markets actually changes and moves up and down every day, uh, we always say that we will try to rebalance and try to adjust our portfolio, but not many of us really actually go down to do it, um, especially when you see your portfolio or equity part dropping by your 30-40%. Um, we let emotions take over a lot of the time in terms of how we rebalance, actually rebalance the portfolio. So I think it's actually good to really have a disciplined approach in terms of rebalancing. Um, so I think that's one. Second is in terms of the investment team. I think we have one of the most stable investment team around for both the fixed income as well as the equity, um, Asian equities uh, team. So I think the Asian equity team is actually managed, uh, the fund itself is actually managed by Martin Lau, who is based in Hong Kong. He has been managing the fund since inception, which is in 2003. So there has been no change in the equity manager for um, the start, since the start of the portfolio. On the fixed income side, um, Nigel, who is based in Singapore, he has been managing the portfolio since 2010, so a good 12 years as well. So I think within uh, First Centia Bridge itself, I would say that the fund itself has been relatively stable. Um, the investment team behind the fund itself has also been very stable and consistent. From Waimi? Yeah, so um, I think one of the things that probably East brings strength is that we are team-based. So there's no equipment on us. So if something were to happen to me, you know, tomorrow there will be someone else that can take over the fund. Uh, we have a relatively large, um, you know, uh, research team. So there will be people who will, you know, not let the ball drop. So I think that's one of the good things about um, East Spring. I think the other thing that we uh, do... Uh, look at is really the long-term returns. We, we don't actually just look at the short-term concerns, but also um, you know, the longer-term investments. So we do want to be consistent. Um, that's the reason why we were not quick to trim Huarong, but we were actually took a position that you know, eventually that will be supported, and that was reflected in our, our, our investment thesis. Thank you so much. And that will conclude our panel on the top selling fund category. Thank you so much to our winners here for joining us this evening. Thank you.